Thanks for joining us, everyone. My name is John Thompson. I'm a communications analyst with Energy Mines and Resources. Thank you for joining us this morning. This is uh, another technical briefing on the heap leach facility failure that occurred at the Eagle Gold Mine. Our aim is to give you an update today on what's new since our last briefing. If you weren't able to attend last week and you're after background information, please reach out to me afterwards and I'll try my best to help out. As we said last week, we appreciate many people have questions and concerns about the situation. We don't have all the answers at this point, but we're here to share what we do know and we commit to provide further updates as more information becomes available. I'd like to introduce our speakers, uh, some of whom will offer introductory comments before we open the floor to questions. Today we're joined by John Stryker, Minister of Energy, Mines and Resources, who will be offering some remarks at the top. We also have Stephen Mead, our Assistant Deputy Minister of Mineral Resources. Kelly Constable is our Director of Mineral Resources. Her branch is the main mining regulator in the territory. With her is Aaron Dowd, Manager of Major Mine Licensing. Will Tunyon is our Director of Compliance, Monitoring and Inspections. With him is Seven Bonnet, the branch's Manager of Major Mines and Operations North. From the Workers' Safety and Compensation Board, we have Bruce Milligan, Director of Workplace Health and Safety. From the Department of Community Services, we have Devin Bailey, Director of Wildfire Management. From the Department of Environment, we have Tyler Williams, a Water Resources Specialist. And joining remotely, I believe, we have Dr. Sudit Ranadad, our Chief Medical Officer of Health. We'll begin with comments from Minister Stryker. Uh, thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Kwanlandun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. And as we discuss the ongoing situation at Victoria Gold, it's important to also acknowledge that we're discussing the traditional territory of the First Nation of Nacho Nayak Dun. As we work together to address the challenges and concerns arising from the heap leach failure, we are committed to respecting and honoring the perspectives and voices of all affected First Nations. As a mining regulator, the government of Yukon's priority is ensuring that mining is conducted safely and that the environment is protected. As part of fulfilling these responsibilities, we have been busy collecting on-site information to guide our next steps, and this data is crucial in shaping our response. <clears throat> we are committed to ongoing test testing in the watershed over time and sharing that information with the public. Last night, we received our first verified results from four samples collected near the mine site on June 25th. The water quality objective leaving the mine site under the water license for Victoria Gold is five parts per billion of cyanide or 0 0.005 milligrams per liter. The samples uh, sorry, the sample taken right next to the bottom of the slide indicates a cyanide presence of 8.58 milligrams per liter. This water is being diverted to a containment structure and will be treated by Victoria Gold. Two sites downstream in Dublin Gulch show nominal levels of cyanide, measuring at 0.001 milligrams per liter and less than 0 0.001 milligrams per liter. The sample of concern collected in Haggart Creek, which is just downstream from where Dublin Gulch enters Haggart Creek, shows elevated levels of cyanide at 0 0.04 milligrams per liter. When we receive these verified results, <clears throat> excuse me, When we received these verified results, we shared them with the First Nation of Nacho Nayak Dun last night. This level of cyanide in Haggart Creek could potentially affect fish. Whether this concentration of cyanide in the water will actually affect fish depends on other chemicals in the water. Water quality sampling is ongoing and fit 
fish toxicity testing is underway. Once it was safe to, uh, to do following the wildfires in the area, we sent crews to continue collecting more samples. Again, it will be ongoing. We've also retained experts in aquatic science and water quality to help us understand the risks and impacts on the aquatic environment. The sample of concern represents a starting data point in a broader series of samples we will need to navigate this situation. It is one piece of the larger puzzle we are diligently putting together. We recognize the need for answers and a comprehensive understanding of the situation. Testing and analysis are ongoing. Our understanding of the situation, as, as testing and analysis uh, are ongoing, our understanding of the situation will become more clear. We appreciate your patience. We are committed to providing ongoing updates to Nacho Night Dunn and the public. Based on new information gathered on site yesterday, Nacho Night Dunn and the Yukon government officials met this morning to establish a joint list of priorities related to safety and environmental protection. Technical experts, experts identified important concerns regarding the stability of the remaining heap, including the potential for further slides and the fact that the camp is below the bottom of the existing slide. Any additional slide has the potential to also risk further environmental contamination. As a mining regulator, we have a range of enforcement tools within our legislation that enable us to address these concerns. We are listening to our technical experts and collective leadership working as quickly as possible across government departments to mitigate these concerns. As Minister of Energy, Mines and Resources, my focus during this evolving situation has been on supporting the Yukon government's efforts to coordinate effectively, work safely and efficiently, and provide accurate updates. From the beginning, government staff have been working hard to manage the situation responsibly while adapting to the changing wildfire conditions in the area. I want to sincerely thank everyone for their understanding as we address this complex and critical issue. We understand the seriousness of the heap leach failure at the Eagle Gold Mine on Monday, June 24th. We all love this place we call home. We all share a responsibility to safeguard it for future generations. That includes our government, Victoria Gold, and everyone else who has the honor to explore and occupy this incredible territory. Many of us have questions, and of course, we want immediate answers. We will continue to provide updates on a regular basis. We understand the importance of people hearing from their government, just as it's important for them to hear directly from the mining company itself. Before we hear from our technical team officials, I want to thank all the government of the Yukon employees uh, who have been tirelessly responding to and informing the community about the impacts of the heap leach failure with as much information as we have available since it happened last week. Thanks as well to wildland firefighters <clears throat> Uh, dealing with all of the fires in the area, which further complicated our response, testing, and supply chains. Supply chains. We deeply appreciate everyone's hard work on this. Thanks, John. I'll stop there and uh, look forward to uh, the rest of the technical briefing. Thank you, Minister. Next, we'll have uh, some remarks from Kelly Constable, our Director of Mineral Resources. Thank you, John, and thank you, Minister. To quickly recap the situation, on Monday, on the morning of Monday, June 24th, a landslide occurred on the ore stockpile on the heap leach facility at the Eagle Gold project. The slide caused the ore to spill over the embankment at the base of the facility. The landslide was about 1.5 kilometers in length. The company estimates that the slide involved about 4 million tons of material. It estimates that about 2 million tons of this material left containment. The company moved quickly following the slide to build dams to hold back the contaminated water being released from the slide material. This water is being pumped into storage ponds. We have not received any reports of serious injuries. The company has voluntarily stopped mining operations at this time. The slide appears to have damaged some mine infrastructure and the extent of this damage is not clear at this point. 
it is too early to say what caused the heat bleach failure. Victoria Gold has reduced its staff at the site to about 60 essential workers. Water treatment is continuing at the site. The company is continuing its water treatment activities and we are, regular, we are in regular communication with company officials. We are also in daily communication with the First Nation of Nacho Nayak Dunn. Our technical staff are committed to working collaboratively, collaboratively with the First Nation and their technical team as well. I'd like to underline that this is the company's site and it is the company's responsibility to manage and respond to this failure. EMR's role as a regulator and enforcement body is to closely monitor the situation and to oversee where appropriate, direct the company's protective and remediation actions and to ensure that the environment is adequately protected. We are requiring that the company provide additional information. This includes daily updates on water management activities. We are also seeking an updated water management plan and an emergency response plan by the end of this week. We have retained a team of experts to assist us in understanding the risks and potential impacts of this event and identifying remediation options. Those experts include a heap leach engineer, a geotechnical engineer, a geochemist, and aquatic scientists. Two of our technical experts visited the site yesterday, joined by Yukon government staff and a technical expert with the First Nation of Nacho Nayak Dunn. This gave them a valuable first-hand look at the site, and we look forward to hearing their perspective and to advise on next steps. Thank you, Kelly. Next, we'll have Will Tunian, Director of Compliance, Monitoring, and Enforcement. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you, John. Uh, our natural resource officers visit mine sites uh, regularly to conduct inspections with the goal of ensuring mine operators are following terms and conditions of their licenses. We have a team of 30 natural resource officers across the territory, including a dedicated team specifically responsible for major mines. Uh, Seven Bonnet is our manager of major mines, and he is overseeing the crew, uh, which is presently at the mine site as we speak. Great, thank you. Um, we will now turn it over to questions. Today, I'd like to ask everyone to keep it to one question uh, per reporter so that I have a chance to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask what's on their mind. If we have time, we'll do follow-up questions. We will begin with reporters in the room. If you're online and you have a question that you'd like to ask, if you could please indicate that in the chat and uh, that will help us organize things. Jim with the Yukon News, do you have a question? Uh, thank you very much. Um, just ha you know, having heard that it remains uh, Victoria Gold's site and their responsibility, um, I'd just like to ask about uh, the communication we received from them this morning that uh, they've received a default notice from some of their lenders. Is there a plan in place? Um, should they no longer be able to uh, carry out their uh, their responsibilities on the site? If you want to make comments, that's great. We'll turn over to Charles. Okay. Um, thanks, Jim. Look, the the situation for Victoria Gold is theirs, and we just got their press release this morning as well. What I will say is that we have been encouraging them to talk with the public, so I'm glad that that is there, and and I was also uh, appreciated that they had some information in there. I mean, we don't, we're not typically involved with the financing of mines. That's not our role. Um, but of course we recognize that uh, when there is this type of slide at, at, at a facility that that's going to put a lot of financial pressure. We all saw what happened to their, their shares. So, of course, we pay attention to that because right now, Victoria Gold are the people who are on site and have the equipment on site and the capability to put in place many of the mitigative measures that we really want to see uh, for uh, 
uh, ensuring safety and uh, and and protecting the environment as much as we can. So, you know, I, we we remain aware that there is uh, 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 that they are facing serious challenges, and we will be prepared to step in if they uh, do go into. If, if they do leave the site or go into default or whatever that looks like. But at this time, we work with the situation as it is. So we act as the regulator and the mining company uh, works to do this work. And I and one of the things that I will note out of their press release that came this morning was that they too have listed the same two priorities that we established in working with Nachonaik Dunn. Number one, safety on the site, and number two, environmental protection. No, those are broad issues, but but th that is has been our main focus, and I'm glad it's theirs as well. Good. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I see we have Sarah from APTN. Would you like to ask a, qu a question? Um, with the levels that have been found, is there any risk to human health with that? Yeah, do we have um, the chief uh, health officer on the call? I'm... We'll just give him a, a moment here. Hello. Does that work now? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's a it's a good question. So I mean, I think when we think about the health impacts we think about them in a few different buckets and I'll try to go through that, right? Many of them have been covered, but just to reiterate, right? The, the first health bucket, the most likely source of the highest exposure in this kind of situation is occupational. And so that is being managed on site by the, by the, um, by the person who is running the facility. So the company that's running the facility is supposed to manage the occupational risk to workers. Um, when you think about downstream effects, you think about a few things, anyone in the immediate vicinity and what their exposures might be. And so certainly for, for recreational water use in the immediate vicinity of the site, we're recommending that people avoid that for now. But that's more of a precaution than a known feature of like that we think that the, the levels are so high that people need to avoid it. It's just because there are still some unknowns around some of the data that's coming through. It's more of a precautionary recommendation. And then when we think about sort of are there any effects further downstream on drinking water use, things like that, um, you know, it's very reassuring that the water samples that have come back from the regulated drinking water system show no concern. And that is also backed by sort of the watershed analysis that's been done by the Department of Environment that shows that there would likely be limited transfer of, of things from that site towards the groundwater system from which that regulated system draws its water source. So, so from a drinking water perspective, um, you know, the watershed analysis plus the confirmatory sampling on the drinking water system uh, shows that there really isn't a concern there. And then when you walk it back again, it's um, it's the worker occupation, so the worker occupational exposures that need to be managed directly on site by the people who are there and by the corporation uh, in control of the facility. And then and the immediate uh, potential exposures as a precaution, we're advising people just to remain away from that, uh, the immediate vicinity of the creek if you're using the waters for recreation. Excellent. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Macklin, do you have a question? See, Kara, uh, yeah, so this is just building off the first question. I understand the uh, Yukon government has $104 million in bonds from uh, Victoria Gold. So now that they've put forward, I guess, this notice of default, is there a chance that you might not see that money. Uh, thanks, Macklin. So the answer is no. First of all, let's get a few things clear here. I, I don't know. I haven't read that in their press release that they've given a notice of default. That isn't that isn't what I've got at all from it. That there there was they were identifying 
other concerns around their loans, but they they would need to approach us and say that they're moving away from this site. Okay, that and that has not happened. Vic Gold is the company on site. Second of all, the whole point of a bond, a surety bond, is to make sure that there is money which has been collected for the remediation of the site should the mine company not complete it. Okay, so the first place we turn is, is to to have the company do the cleanup. That's that's the process. And to be upfront, uh, we reviewed the 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 bond for uh, Victoria Gold this past January, and they are fully paid up. Okay, so that's that's the good news. The difference, of course, now is that the site is not what it was back in January, and so that's going to cause us to rethink those those questions and maybe some of the team can talk more about about how technically that works but that but it, we're not in that situation and we do have that money secured and it would be used for remediation should the mine company uh, cease working does anyone from minerals want to elaborate on that or yeah I think it's an important point to note that the security is based upon the remediation plan that a company submits, and that um, implies and is predicated upon a known state of the site at that time. As the minister said, you know, there's been an event and the state of that site has now changed. One of the things that we have to do amongst many things right now is to look at what that might mean in terms of the actions you would have to take should the event uh, occur when you have to remediate the site. Of course, now, as, as as Kelly said earlier, we have some material from the heat leach that has escaped containment. Obviously, that would now require excavation replacement when it's safe to do so, should that have to be an, an outcome that remediation is necessary. So we, we would have to look at that remediation plan and then adjust it to match the current conditions. But that's something that's a, a contingency, depending on the outcomes of many other things. But that's something in the background that we're bending our mind to right now. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Tim from the Yukon Star, do you have a question? Tim here. Yes, I do. I guess my question would be for the minister. Do you have any reaction to the statement yesterday from Nacho Nayak Dunn uh, demanding an immediate stop to mining in their territory? Um, thanks for the question, Tim. I, there are several things that I, I heard from Chief Hope uh, and both in the statement and in her comments and in the meetings that I had with her last week. Uh, she talked about the importance of land use planning. We are working to do land use planning. Uh, I, I've made that personal commitment to her and I know the land use planning team has been working closely uh, over the past year to establish it. It, it has some complications of course, because uh, the other two First Nations within that planning region have indicated to us they don't want to move forward with land use planning at this time. And so we've, we're, we're working to find that path to to do it together uh, respectfully with NND. Uh, with respect to um, uh, legislation, we, I think she made that comment today about uh, the importance of, of uh, rewriting the Yukon's uh, legislation, minerals legislation. Uh, that work is ongoing and, and uh, NND has been at the table all along and I appreciate their involvement. Um, with respect to the deeper question that she has posed, uh, you know, uh, I think that that we uh, have heard that uh, uh, request, and I think that we will uh, take time to think about it. The, the one thing that I want to just point out is that it you, you want to be careful that like Victoria Gold has an important role right now. And that role is, is to address the safety concerns and the environmental concerns. And they are an important piece of this puzzle. And I, I, I'm not sure if this is exactly what the, 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 was meant in the, in the statement that came out from NND, and I haven't had a chance to clarify with them. But you really don't want to say to Vic Gold, please stop doing that work. You, you want Vic Gold to be doing that work right now. It's important. 
Um, and, and, you know, like I just, I just think you would never want a consequence like that because right now our focus needs to be, and, and I think that NND agreed with this and at least in my direct meetings and, and I believe from the team, from the technical team sitting down with them, number one is safety on the site. And number two is environmental protection. And given those concerns are our focus, that's what I've asked our team to work on. This stopping mining doesn't change that, right? Those are important priorities that we need to address. And I think the, the deeper question that they have posed, I think will take time to work through. I thank them for their comments. I certainly thank them for their involvement and I thank them for their concerns. Thank you. Jackie, do you have a question? Let's start with one. <laughs> um, sorry, I just want to pick up on um, the last question, but to be 100% clear, Natural Nagdan has called for an immediate halt of all mining activities on its traditional territory. Will you commit to that? They're also calling okay. for an independent investigation or public inquiry of sorts. That call has also been backed by the White River First Nation. Will you commit to that? Um, <clears throat> Jackie, I'll just give the same answer that I just gave uh, to Tim. I, when when I had a conversation with Nacho Naik Dunn, and and it include, included some of their technical folks, we talked about uh, the company and their... Uh, priorities. And, and I was happy to see Victoria Gold state that their priorities are environmental protection and, uh, and safety, because those were the ones that uh, Nacho Naik Dan and us as a government had agreed are the top priorities. So I sure hope that there, that, that there wouldn't be this unintended consequence of this suggestion that we would lose the ability to achieve those two goals right now so who has the equipment on site at at the eagle gold mine it's victoria gold who has the the staff on site and the expertise on site victoria gold so i would like to work with them to achieve as much environmental protection and safety as we can at this time and that is my priority. So, so is the answer there no? The, the answer that I just gave and will give, give again is that we've heard NND with their request and, and I have to turn back. It's a big question to shut down mining. I'm pretty sure they don't wish to shut down the work that's happening to do that environmental remediation at the site right now. And that is the mine company that is doing that work. So I, I you're asking me this, I, I understand you wanna uh, uh, get a response from me around whether we're going to fulfill this request. All I'm saying at this point is we've heard it and we will consider it. Then you also asked about uh, uh, this question of a, a, an independent investigation. When we met with Nacho Naik done last week, we agreed that, that we should go back, talk. Well, it, it, we said, okay, let's talk about that and, and consider uh, what it looks like. So we gave each other a task. So I will meet with uh, uh, my government to talk that through. And I am sure we all want to get at the questions of what caused this. When I talked with some of the technical experts over the past couple of days, you know, one of the ways that you would start to investigate what it is that caused it would have you getting up on the heap leach, maybe drilling a test hole. But it, we don't think it's safe to do that. So if, if that investigation is not supportive of the safety priority, and the priority of environmental protection, then it's going to take time. Absolutely, we want to uh, resolve that question of what caused this. And, and I think that 
that what we said with NND was let's let's both go back and think what that would look like and then come forward at our next meeting to talk about that and to come up with a shared vision of what that could look like. So I don't, I, you, you have to understand that this crew, I mean, first of all, we had a fire, it took out the power to the mine. Uh, they then went on generators. We had a fire on the North Klondike. It made it difficult for uh, getting supplies into the mine. We worked with HPW and Wildland Fire to get, to get those supplies ferried across. We've had fires in the site which required evacuation of or, or reducing the number of personnel to, to, to essential on site. That's all in the middle of trying to address this. This team and NND's team has been flat out. They're working hard to get the public information and us as government's information so that we can make the best choices possible. I do think that there needs that, that we have to get the deeper answers, but I do think we need to keep those priorities up front. And so we, what we did was we committed to uh, NND last week to come back to another, uh, another, the next time we sit down as a group and look at what, how that could be framed. And the next day I had suggestions from the deputy minister about tools we could use around those, those types of, you know, analysis. <laughs> Thank you for that, Minister. Um, I'd like to shift to letting some of the reporters joining remotely to ask. I'm sorry, there's one more reporter in there. All right, uh, introduce yourself and ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, Stuart Bunnell, Shown FM. Um, I'm. I really wish I had a chance to ask the last two questions. Um, but what does reconciliation look like going forward, um, considering everything that's been everything that's happened in the last week and a half. How, how does reconciliation for First Nation of Nacho Nike done look um, if, uh, if, uh, if, if, for instance, the, uh, the halting all mining isn't possible? Reconciliation has so many facets. I... Yesterday, we were talking about call to action number 17 with the cabinet, nothing to do with this, but there's, there's so many pieces which we're working on all the time. I think in this instance, what are we doing around it? Like how are we working with NND to try and make this better? We, uh, for example, they, they asked us to support them in, uh, uh, around the technical experts that we were bringing on. They said, uh, I got on the night that it happened, I got a call from the executive director. He said, you need to let me know who's going to site. I sent him a note that night to say, here's who's going up. And he said, well, who are you getting as a heat bleach expert? And so we had already put the call in. I think it had probably been Aaron who put the call in, but whoever it was, we, the next day we secured one of our technical experts and we said, this is who we've got. And they said, oh, that, that person is great. They said, okay, we're, we have people that we want to bring on. Can you provide us funding for those technical experts? And we said, yes. And then yesterday we had a, a, a crew, two of our technical experts, we had planned for three of our officials uh, to head up, inspectors to head to the mine site. Uh, with a helicopter flight to go up there and get as much information as they could to come on back and, and share it with us as governments. But in that moment, you know, I said, okay, hold on, where's NND here? So what we did was we bumped one of our inspectors and we put one of NND's inspectors onto the flight. And then we got our other person to drive up and to do a bunch of sampling as well, water sampling. So Look, I, uh, I appreciate your question, Stuart, about the importance of reconciliation. I guess we should never lose sight of it, but honestly, I think the, the, the point, and, and I hear Chief Hope's uh, words in my head, where uh, 
she's talking about the importance of working collaboratively and uh, working closely. And we, we are making efforts to do that. And, and at the same time, we're also trying to navigate wildfires. We're also trying to navigate this very difficult situation. It, there's a lot going on at once. So uh, I, I, I just recommit to, for us to, to work closely with NND so that the solutions will be as good as possible. Do I think that we will always agree? No, but an NMI, you know, it, I heard Chief come out and talk about it and express concern about whether we were taking it seriously enough. And I heard uh, uh, one of her technical experts, Cord, come out and talk about that last week. I've known Cord for many years. I'm glad that he's working on the project uh, with NND. And so I'll take that criticism and, th and that's fine, but, I will also say, from my perspective, this team has been working very hard to to address a difficult situation, and I think that that we will continue to work closely with NND. Thanks for that. We have some people online looking to ask questions. Ashley with Canadian Press says so she has many questions. We'll let her ask one. Ashley, when you're able. Success. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I am just a little bit bamboozled by the press release that Victoria Gold sent out maybe an hour or so before this scheduled press conference that they presumably would have known about, which says that their water testing has found no cyanide. Do you have any explanation for why their results would be so different than the ones that your experts have found? Sorry, that's fine. Start and then we'll go. Um, hi, Ashley. Uh, I think that we need to understand that what, what our experts were telling us is that we need a lot of samples. We need a lot of samples over time. We need a lot of samples in different locations, and uh, and 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 so far we started collecting those samples, and then we got uh, fires uh, entered, and we 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 that, that it got interrupted. But the point is, we need to be taking a lot of samples, and we're going to see them. That like again, I I, I use the analogy for us of COVID. There can be some false negatives. There can be some false positives. And it's, and it's as you get more and more information that we will get a clearer and clearer picture of what it's looking like. And so, and I think I said this yesterday to the media, if you see a, a sample that says, no, you don't have cyanide, that doesn't mean that the risk is gone. You, you, it, this is, this is, uh, uh, a serious and significant slide over time we will need to do a lot of monitoring to understand uh how where and when uh uh those those potential contaminants are moving through either the surface or the groundwater and 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 what what that looks like so so i uh, NND is also collecting samples, and 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 I think there there should be hearing back sometime in the next couple of days or day or so, and so we're going to start to get a clearer picture in time, and uh, uh, seeing no cyanide at one point in time doesn't mean that there aren't uh, or other. Uh, uh, constituent elements that we're concerned about. It doesn't mean that you can't keep looking. And uh, we know that uh, a big chunk of the heap uh, leach came beyond containment. And we know that, that there is uh, cyanide in that, cyanide solution in that. So we will have to do a lot of testing over time. Anything further from staff or is that good? 
The only note I would add is that we're working with the First Asian of Nacho and I have done um, daily and sorting out information sharing processes between ourselves and also looking to that with the company as well. So, Thank you, Kelly. Um, I see that Lindsay Duncombe with The National would like to ask a question. Being asked to be so, unmuted. I would say that. Thanks. I think I can you hear me now. We can hear you. Yes. Um, my question is about the possibility of Maybe. further slides and on the site. Yeah. What kind of concern do you have about stability yeah. there? What work is being done to prevent further uh, slides from happening and getting into the environment? And how challenging is that when it appears as though the territory and the company aren't necessarily singing from the same songbook. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Stephen Mead, our Assistant Deputy Minister of Mineral Resources, would like to feel that one. And if you can mute yourself, we're yep. hearing something background. Thank you. Thanks, John. And thanks for the question, Lindsay. And, and in a moment, I'm going to talk, I'm going to turn to, to Mark. I'm just giving Mark notification that I'm going to turn to him because he is our heat le leach expert. But I just want to let you know that this morning, there was a technical meeting between Nacho and I have done and ourselves, including Chief Hope. Um, the potential for remobilization or additional movement of that heap leach was identified as a risk. We talked very briefly about the sort of mitigations or things you would have to do on the ground to limit the impacts of that. We also talked a little bit about what might be possible to prevent that happening. As you recognized, it's a dynamic situation on site. Um, safety can't be assured if you're on the pad, so it does make it more challenging. But we did agree, and we are meeting again this afternoon, and that's one of the one of the pieces that we're going to work with their technical team on to start to describe the actions that we need to take right now, um, on the company needs to take right now, to prevent future mobilization and future incidents. You've seen the photo, I'm sure. There's a photo right there up on the screen. I don't know if you can see that, Lindsay. You can see the slide um, um location right now. You can also see down from the slide, there's a pond and even further down from the slide, there's a camp. They jump out quite obviously as potential risks should that be that slide be mobilized. So we're working very quickly to understand what could happen and what we would need to do to respond and also to mitigate the likelihood. Now, I'm going to turn to Mark. So this is your acknowledgement, Mark, to speak. Um, but just uh, explain a little bit about to, to everybody in the room about what the mechanisms may be and what those sort of risks might look like of an additional movement. Mark, if you could quickly introduce yourself as well for the benefit of people. Joining yes, thank you. Thank this you. is Mark Smith. I'm uh, both a geotechnical engineer and a heap leach specialist. I think Kelly called me a heap leach expert early, earlier. I appreciate the flattery. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's actually a fantastic question. Um, I think I think the risk of, of secondary failures or re-triggering failures is pretty significant, especially as we move into the summer wet season. Um, we get The site gets, on average, about 100 millimeters um, in July and in August, so each month. So that's enough rainfall to make me worried about, um, about remobilizing parts of the slide. As my first professor of geotechnical engineering told me that if, there wasn't, if it wasn't for water, we wouldn't need geotechnical engineers. Um, and so my whole career, that's turned out to be true. It's always water that causes these problems. Uh, in that picture, we're looking at the debris flow that's left containment down the center of Dublin Gulch. And on the right is, is a bit of the slide that's off containment. And then there's more slide material to the right and off that picture. The debris flow itself is not likely to, to remobilize into a landslide. Um, but erosion of that material in, in big cloudbursts uh, concerns me and moving that sediment down down the ravine further. On Off the picture, and I'm, I'm sure most people here have seen the, the pictures that are on law, that are available online, there's a there's a subvertical scarp at the head of the rotational failure. That scarp is on the order of 50 or 60 meters high. And it's very, very steep. It's too steep to be stable. That that slope will come down. It will either come down in a big rainstorm or Vic Gold will find some way to safely bring it down. That 
will be part of our conversation this afternoon on how how what are the possible ways to bring that down safely. Because we can't get up on the slide, we certainly can't, you know, we can't walk on the slide, we can't bring heavy equipment on the slide, so we have limited options on how we can stabilize that slope. But that slope is very vulnerable to uh, re-triggering in a rainfall. And if that scarp re-triggers and leaves containment, it could also cause some of this debris flow we're looking at in this picture to also move. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Mark. I, you know, I, I think it's clear to say that everybody is very alive to that risk. The company's very alive to that risk. NND is very alive to that risk. And we're very alive to that risk. You know, working with NND right now and this afternoon, we've got to identify the measures that need to be taken on site. And we need to make sure they happen so that we mitigate those risks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we have Niall McGee with the Global Mail on the call. Niall, would you like to ask a question? Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, if I remember correctly, um, Minister said, or somebody said, 2 million tons of uh, material had left containment. Um, approximately how much cyanide is in that 2 million tons? Uh, if you could specify, just give me a round figure in terms of uh, the quantity. I'm, I'm sure that's knowable because uh, the company would, would have a, an estimation, I'm sure, and I'm sure it would have been relayed to you guys. So if you could just approximate uh, the amount. Thank you. I think we're going to rely on on Mark here. You, the the question being the amount of material that escaped containment from the from the pad. Have we got preliminary estimates of how much cyanide solution that may have contained? Um, I I've made some preliminary, very preliminary, and very broad brush <laughs> estimates. The the ore on the heap when it was under leach contains about 14% moisture, and that's based on Vic Gold's own experts in their annual water balance modeling um, and their latest report. When that debris came off the pad and left containment, and I think 2 million tons is the current best estimate, and it, having seen the site yesterday, it's reasonably close. So 14% so of 2 million tons would be... 300, roughly 300,000 cubic meters that was in it when it left. Some of that material, some of that 300,000 cubic meters has flowed into the underlying um, placer tailings, placer, uh, yeah, placer mine tailings. Um, the slide on the heap contains roughly the same amount of water, and, and that's also been draining out, and I would assume draining through this debris flow and also into those placer tailings. So, um, the residual moisture content, that is the moisture content in that material after it's been allowed to drain for a while, and, and a, a, per the same experts and the same study, is somewhere around 8%. So the current water content or solution content in that material will be something between 14 and 8%. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, I see we have Blair McBride with the Northern Miner. Blair, would you like to ask a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, so it, it was mentioned in the, the technical briefing last week that uh, Victoria Gold um, would face charges uh, from this incident. Um, what specific charges are they facing? Um, I think you might have a wire crossed. I don't believe we said that last week. You may have, there, there was some discussion about existing charges against the company. Okay, what exactly are the existing charges? So I, I can turn you over to Will Tunyon. He's our Director of Compliance, Monitoring, and Inspections. Sure. The company isn't facing any charges right now. We're still gathering information. Uh, current charges, uh, I mentioned last week, um, the company's facing several charges. It's, it's in regards to proper handling of water. Um, they have terms and conditions that are licensed in regards to water management on site. And the allegations currently before the court are from between October 2022 and October 2023. And in fairness to the company, uh, the charges are before the court, so it probably wouldn't be appropriate for me to give any more details. Okay. Thank you for that, Will. Um, I see online 
Uh, someone named Camille has raised her hand. Not familiar with the news outlet. Give them a moment. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Yes, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so my question is actually in the French. Um, if you don't mind uh, answering that one, that would be great. Uh, in French. So, donc, on parle, si j'ai bien compris, on parle de niveau dans la rivière Aga. We're getting an, a bad echo. It's making very uh, okay. difficult to hear you. But, you might need to mute something on, on your side, like the, the audio on your computer. Okay. Give me one sec. Is that? I think that's better. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Est-ce que j'ai bien compris donc que la rivière Agarth a des niveaux dix fois plus élevés que les niveaux acceptés? Et si oui, quelles seraient les conséquences euh, sur euh, les poissons, par exemple, et aussi sur la qualité de l'eau? Est-ce que est-ce que l'eau est potable sur cette rivière? Parce que j'entends parler que les Premières Nations utilisent cette rivière. Je vais essayer de, de répondre à votre question. Euh, premièrement, il y a une petite rivière, comme un rousseau, euh, qui s'appelle Dublin Gulch. Et à côté de ça, c'est une rivière euh, euh, Haggart, en français, Haggart euh, Creek. Après ça, c'est le, le McQuesten, en, en anglais, river, mais pour vous, rivière. Et après ça, c'est le fleuve du Yukon. Ah oh, non, uh, McQuesten, uh, après ça, c'est Stuart, après ça, c'est Yukon, fleuve Yukon. Alors, chaque fois, le, le, le rivière, c'est plus large. Par exemple, uh, Yukon, c'est plus large que Stuart. Stuart, c'est plus large que McQuesten. McQuesten, c'est plus large que Agart. Alors, chaque fois, le cyanide change le pourcentage. Et nous avons des spécialistes ou des experts avec ce chose-là. C'est aujourd'hui, nous avons une, une première point d'information avec cyanide plus haut ou trop haut et on demande de les experts qu'est-ce que c'est la situation pour les, les poissons. Mais le, maintenant, le plus grand risque, c'est dans la rivière Agathe. Ce n'est pas euh, après ça et certainement ce n'est pas avant ça, mais c'est Uh, c'est une question en demande uh, uh, avec les experts des, des poissons et toxicology. J'espère que ça marche. Thank you for that, Minister. Um, Kelly McTavish with the CBC is online. Uh, Kelly, you can ask a question. Being asked to unmute Camille. She was with Kelly. Can you? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, my question is um, the doctor said that it is being communicated um, not to drink from the streams for recreational purposes as a precaution. I'm curious where that is being communicated or how that is being communicated. Um, would like to field that. Should we send it back to health? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we could have the chief medical health officer speak to that, that'd be great. Hi. Thanks for that. So it. Um, 
this is really with respect to recreational water use. And, and generally when we say that, we're not talking about drinking as a, as a primary drinking water source. We're actually talking about like incidental ingestion of, of water during recreation. And so that is, that is much, much less of a concern. We're actually asking people to avoid the immediate vicinity for recreational purposes. And we're looking at uh, working with other departments to create some signage, I believe, so that that can be posted uh, and perhaps some other messaging around that for people in the area. But, but it is, but I want to be clear that this is not, um, uh, there is no, we're not making specific recommendations around drinking the water because it's not thought to be a primary drinking water source. So the recommendations are really around recreational water use and the incidental potential for ingestion from that use. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, um, I appreciate everyone's interest in this and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we, we do commit to continue to provide uh, more information as we're able to. Thank you very much.